It's been said that many people have a one-track mind. Well, in my case today, I've got a few more. We're about to go back to the land of the A-track as Tech Throwback starts now. Hello and welcome to Tech Throwback, the program that brings you the techno trends from way back when. I'm your host, Bill Robert, and today we'll catch some waves, some short waves that is. We'll also play around a little bit with Captain Kirk. But first, as promised at the head of the show, let's go A-tracking. It's today's sound idea. Welcome to the Tech Throwback Entertainment Center. And as I mentioned, we're going A-track today. Vintage piece of audio here that I found recently. And your, your standard AM, FM receiver, tuner. It's got AM, FM, FM stereo. Uh, also uh, input for a phonograph. But of course, the reason why we have this here today is this beautiful little A-track player here. But before we get to the uh, intricacies of the A-track player, let's take a look at the Tech Throwback white paper. The A-track tape is also known as Stereo 8. It's a tape format consisting of an endless tape loop in a plastic cartridge. It was derived from the broadcast cartridges used in radio stations from 1959 till right through the 1990s until computers started to take over that job. It was designed by an employee of the Learjet Corporation in 1963, believe it or not, and the first in-car models were introduced by Ford in some of their vehicles in 1966. The tape program consists of four stereo tracks recorded side by side on the tape in switchable programs. So you have four programs, two tracks each, so that's where the eight track comes from. Eventually, sales were overtaken in market share by the compact cassette and obviously later on to the compact disc. The last major label release on eight track was in the 80s. No. The last major label release on a track was in the late 1980s, and some specialty labels are still producing items on a track tape. So here's a unit right here, vintage Panasonic, probably I'd say about uh, early to mid 1970s. You see even like the really old Panasonic logo. You've got the quarter inch headphone jack there. Everything in the back is RCA. And some in some units you have a separate on off switch here. It's just ganged on the volume pot. So here you go, turn it on. You see the dial light up. And uh, let's start um, real quick just by going to FM and let's see there you go actually considering we're in the middle of a building and this has no antenna connected to it that's actually not not a bad bit of reception there so there we go and you've got the input selector here so we both go up here you would have and we'll go through them down here right now and just turn the volume down you would have AM then FM FM stereo and then you had phono and then you had tape. And the tape is actually where we want to go today because a track tape is an interesting thing. I mentioned in the white paper, it's a cartridge. Basically, that's your a track tape. A lot of people remember these from the 70s and the 60s. But in this particular case, um, a lot of people go, what's an a track Of course, I'm still put aside by people who look at my record collection. They're like, what are those big, thin things? And I feel about 100 years old. But actually, the funny thing is I feel 100. But uh, I came out the same year as the a track that probably should make me feel kind of old. But anyway, so you see here, this is the uh, actual unit itself, and it's a cartridge. Tape is all in a loop, and it's inside on a reel in here. Now, the main difference between the 8-track and a broadcast cartridge, other than the fact that this has 8 tracks and the broadcast cartridge only has either 2 or 3 tracks, depending on whether it's mono or stereo, is the fact that everything here is self-contained, including the pinch roller. Now, the pinch roller is what moves against the uh, spinning uh, metal rod called the capstan, and so when you stick the uh, unit in the drive, it just connects up and starts to roll the tape. In a broadcast cartridge, actually, there's a hole here where the uh, pinch roller is from the machine and comes up into the machine, and that's what starts playback. So you have the tape here, and then you have the tape, uh, you have pressure pads on the tape too, which hold it against the heads. There were tons of these things out back in the day, and uh, they actually even had little carry cases. You actually see one right over here where it's a little thing, basically it has a handle, you pick it up, and you've got your A-Track tapes to bring with you in the car. Obviously, if you had a cassette case, you could have a lot more in a smaller space. But you see here, I mean, a lot of major artists from that time, Foreigner, Toto, the Rolling Stones, the Commodores, Bed Midler, well, it's actually the Rose soundtrack. Uh, but this one, actually, I found this on eBay, and this collection was complete. This is the way I bought it. And it's funny because we have here, you've got, as I mentioned, the Stones, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, the Commodores, Linda Ronstadt, 
And then you've got the Carpenters and Judy Garland. So it's, it's, it's a little of an eclectic uh, kind of thing. But nonetheless, uh, let's uh, go back here and uh, take a look at this beautiful A-Track deck. And uh, once again, it says A-Track stereo right here. Now, you see there's a button here that says channel. You realize there aren't many controls for the tape transport here. With a standard compact cassette or even CD later on, you would have uh, forward or back or things like that. Well, obviously, you can't do rewind on an 8-track cartridge because it's only meant for the tape to spill out one way. Uh, and some places had fast forwards, but sometimes that could cause a little problem with the tape pack. The only real transport control you had here was this channel button. What this did was, as you remember from the white paper, we said there were four channels per tape. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So let's go to track one right now. Let's load in a, a, a tape. And there we go, we have tape. Okay, so the tape's playing now. You get the volume right here. And it goes back and forth. And that's pretty much the simplicity of the whole thing. It's just one tape loop that goes around. Now there are some interesting parts about this. First of all, a track tape normally there was about uh, a thing, you know, set time per program, obviously, because it, it's four separate channel, four separate programs going on the same loop of tape. Now, sometimes when it came to a song or an album where the length didn't fit, what they had to do was, in some cases, as the first program ended, they would have to fade down the track and then bring it up on the following on the f following program, which it's really annoying because you're listening and you're getting in the song. All of a sudden, you hear it fade out. You're going, what's going on? Ka-chunk, it changes program. And you hear it fade up again. It, that was one of the uh, actual shortcomings of the 8-track format. Now, the way it changed channels, obviously, you can change. You can just hit the button to change the channel, too. But I mentioned that you've got, in fact, see right there. Just change it right there. What you've got here is a tape loop. And the tape loop is basically spliced together by a piece of foil. It's a foil splicing tape. And when that piece of foil comes through the tape pack and hits the sensor in here, that tells the unit that, okay, this track is done, it's time to change to the next one. So you can either just punch this and go through any, any track at your leisure, or just let it go and let the change happen by itself. If you wanted to queue up, as I mentioned, some of these decks had fast forward where you go, but pretty much it has nothing like cassette, and even cassette, I mean, CD is obviously the best for random access. If you're in track five, you want to go back to track two, nothing beats CD. But in its day, a track was pretty cool. The other thing, too, is sometimes cassettes, cassettes would get eaten. Uh, cassette decks with the small transports got very finicky. And with CDs, if you hit a big bump in the road, sometimes it would skip, or if there was dirt or something on the CD, it would skip or it wouldn't read. Uh, that, that's something where a lot of times these were fairly durable in that sense, but obviously the shortcomings, I think, are kind of what led to their downfall. But if you'd never seen an A-Track or heard of an A-Track, here you go. That's just a little quick thing. And once again, I'll take a, basically just show you here. So here it is once again. Here's the label. And usually what it is is you had the label that went over the... Um, edge here so that you, even in the rack you could tell what it was. And there is pretty much kind of a representation of the album art. It's a smaller version of it like you had on a cassette or in a CD. I mean, I've mentioned before I'm a vinyl guy because with, you see something like this and that's some nice art, but then picture this out to like full album size. And, and that's the thing where a lot of the smaller formats you just lost a lot with the album cover art. But there you go. And then here's the tape once again. You basically get the um, uh, the cap, the uh, pinch roller right here, which holds the tape against the caption, and that's what actually makes the tape drive. It's not like a cassette or a videotape where you have the little notched hubs that the little gear goes in and turns around. This basically, the tape is turning by itself with the pressure of the capstan on the pinch roller. And so, back in the day, these were fun. In fact, they had some really cool players, too. Panasonic actually had this round, portable A-Track player that sometimes, if you see, like, uh, like one of these VH1, I love the 70s things, they sh that shows up a lot as a, as a proper set piece because that was one of the really distinct 70s things, not just an 8-Track player, but one with really wild, uh, way-out design. So that was one of the ways that people used to take their music with them. I mean, nowadays you take it on your phone or you take it, you know, or, you know just have a CD or something in the car, although 99% of people just stream stuff on the phone all day or, or online or whatever. But once upon a time, we didn't have all that cool stuff. I'm sounding like my parents now. And uh, we had to have things like this, either cassettes or 8-tracks. They actually had, believe it or not, they had record players for the car too. And obviously you didn't want to go over bumpy roads with that because da 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 it would just go all over the place. But uh, a very portable music format, it just didn't have the legs of some of the other formats, but there you go. You've seen it, you've heard it, 8-track tape. And coming up next, we're going to stick in the audio realm. We're actually going to take a look at uh, shortwave radio, which is something else that computers have kind of 
rendered not as cool as it used to be. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to do that right now. It's a new segment, and this is something we're calling Vintage Voltage. <laughs> Well, we're back in the workshop now, and we've got this beauty. This is, uh, we mentioned, vintage voltage. This is an old shortwave radio. It's a multiband unit where you can pick up radio broadcasts from around the world. Now, in this day and age, you know, it's not a big thing. I mean, once upon a time, when I first uh, I got my first short, well, shortwave radio from my dad, probably, I'd say, around 1978 or so, and at the time, it was fun to listen to, even like AM at night, obviously. I don't know if you know the difference or not, but AM and FM are different uh, in the basic way that the frequencies go. FM is what's called long wave, where you have the tower, and the wave just kind of goes all the way down. And if you're in that reach, you're fine. But AM, especially at night, has this thing where the waves bounce off the Earth, off the ionosphere, and keep going, which is why, for instance, at night you can hear WBZ in Boston in 38 states. And that was part of the thing with shortwave radio, too. With the short waves, they basically bounce back and forth, and you could get all kinds of things. I remember when I was a kid listening to the BBC World Service on the shortwave radio at the time. It blew me away because here I was sitting in my little bedroom in uh, just a small little condo in Methuen and listening to something going coming from London. I thought that was really, really cool at the time. And even with a cheap AM radio, you pick up every once in a while a distant broadcast. You know, one, one time I was listening to the California Angels baseball on their flagship station out somewhere in Anaheim, and I thought that was pretty wild. And obviously, it's not a singular hobby for me. There are, are clubs that have come out over the years, ham clubs, radio clubs, shortwave clubs, DXers, they call them basically, where they try and listen to a distant broadcast, and they have a, all types of different types of radio, some really sensitive so they can try and pick up faraway broadcasts. So that was back in the day. Nowadays, with the internet, you could have your internet radio station and have it go anywhere like that. You don't have to sit up in the middle of the night playing with dials and knobs. Once again, that was kind of fun for old school folks like me. But uh, once again, you can just click now. You don't have to do all that other stuff. And uh, that's one of those things where, you know, it's... it's, it's <clears throat> I don't know. It, it's still amazing. I, mean, I used to have an internet radio station through Live 365 before they uh, got rid of the small webcasters exemption and the whole thing just vaporized. But uh, even then, I was glad to see people were listening from Italy. I got some listening from Australia, things like that. So I mean, it's, it's still cool to hear, hear things, but it's still not the same as like being up in the middle of the night and twiddling the dials and trying to find something from around the world that you don't think you're going to get. I mean, with the internet, yeah, you can get the radio, but you can basically just click on and get it. There's no real surprise. Whereas and as you were listening at night, trying to figure out what was going to come in, you know, it was always a, a real good surprise to see what was coming in. But I'm becoming my parents here, and back in my day, we didn't have all this stuff. So let me just go back to this, the Realistic DX120 Star Patrol communications receiver. And before we delve into the details of this radio receiver, let's take a look at the Tech Throwback white paper. The DX120 Star Patrol communications receiver was released in 1970 by the Tandy Corporation, sold through their Radio Shack outlets. The unit was actually manufactured in Japan, and the retail at the time was $69.95. Now, the tuner picked up AM and shortwave broadcasts, but you could also pick up the signals from ham radio and CB radio sets as well. Users could listen via the internal speaker, or they could use headphones or an external speaker. The unit had two power modes. It could either operate off the attached AC power cord, or it could also run off of an external DC supply. Production on the unit stopped shortly thereafter. It actually made its last appearance in the 1971 Radio Shack catalog. So you see here, you've got your uh, different scales. First of all, you've got your standard broadcast, which is up here, which basically this is your like 5.5, uh, and it goes all the way to 16. Obviously, this was an older unit. This was before they expanded the uh, AM band up to 1700. So right there, you had basically, uh, well, technically, it starts at 5.4, 540, but you have 5.5, and then you've got 6, 7, 8, 9, so like WRK would be right here, WBZ would be right here, so on and so forth. So that was standard broadcast, and the way you picked that was you actually had your, your different band selectors here, A, B, C, and D, and your band selector switch was here, A, B, C, and D. Now, one of the things is I'm not going to actually like power this up and try and test it because, once again, we're in a metal building, and metal building and AM and shortwave radio don't come in very well anyway, A. B, a lot of the uh, shortwave uh, uh, providers, some of them which have gone away or, or they've uh, given way to Internet radio. So there's not as much out there as there used to be. So I'm just basically showing you the, the, whole, the whole system right now, but uh, we're not going to power this up and really do a demo. So now you see the blue band here where it says band B. Uh, you see... It's got some markings on it other than just 
you know, just the numbers like you had here in Band A. You see it says Marine here. It says WWV. Now, WWV was a station that uh, was basically, it was a government station that ran on multiple frequencies. And what it did was basically set the time. So you would hear, if you tuned into WWV, you would hear a time chirp just every second. Beep, beep. Beep. And then at the top of the minute, it would be a different pitch beep. There are actually uh, master clock systems for public buildings, schools, radio stations that actually tuned into WWV and used that time signal to keep itself synced to the proper time of day. So that's kind of a cool thing there. All right, so you're seeing here, once again, you've got WWV. And then as you go to the others, they've got different marks too. Uh, some countries had their own... Uh, international uh, markings and as you go through here band C and band D there is a lot as you get to the higher frequencies where you got to um, up around uh, 30 megahertz here. Uh, in addition you had some other knobs here obviously I just mentioned the uh, the band switch in which you basically you're tuning on either one of these four bands depending on where you have the switched here. Uh, you can also fine tune it you can widen the bandwidth or narrow the bandwidth as far as the search you can actually change the tuning so you can go fine or coarse there you had your um, on off switch and your volume knob here and uh, also you had uh, your RF gain switch where if you wanted to you could actually dial up or dial down the sensitivity depending on what you were trying to pick up and that's a look at this uh, classic realistic all band receiver once again it got AM radio no FM though obviously because there was a little different uh, bit of circuitry in there but it was AM and it was shortwave and it was a lot of fun to listen to the other thing is you had to really have a good antenna and uh, full disclosure here before we started this take I actually tried to get something in, in here it just wasn't happening I got a faint little bit of something uh, your femur cameraman I think you heard too where we get a f faint bit of, of something that was AM which I think was one of the local, local stations it might have been whatever's on 1490 now out of Haverhill but I did have a small uh, just a little bit of hookup wire here and uh, this is about as basic an antenna as you're going to get this puts the rude in rudimentary believe me but uh, anyway once again uh, the thing that this receiver and receivers like it were a lot of fun back in the day to try and see what you'd pick up both on AM and on shortwave 2 from around the world so there we go the Radio Shack realistic DX120 Star Patrol communications receiver and uh, that'll finish this look at this item. But coming up next, we're going to beam ourselves up. We're going to get involved in space, the final frontier, with today's piece of handy tech. <laughs> dun, ta -da, dun, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Here we go, folks. The Star Trek Super Phaser 2 target game and basically this was a thing for kids where you could go around and shoot and actually this only contained one set so what you had to do is make sure that if you were going to do this with a friend make sure he had a phaser too because otherwise if you're doing a thing where you're going down around trying to phaser each other hey, I've got you wait can I borrow your phaser for a second yeah that's not going to fly at all but before we take a look at the Star Trek Super Phaser 2 target game let's take another look at the tech throwback white paper the Star Trek Super Phaser 2 Target Game. It was released in 1976 by the Mego Corporation, which was based out in New York City. The unit came with a single phaser and a single target. The set worked using simple light, a reflective target, and a receptive photocell. Basically, just worked, you bounced light off the target, and if the photocell caught the light, bingo, you were rewarded the win. It was one in a line of Mego electronic replicas of Star Trek devices. They also had some communicators, they had a tricorder, and other things too. The uh, command communications console, the phaser battle game, there was a ton of stuff that Mego made in order to cash in on the, not, not in the original Star Trek trick craze, because once again, this was the mid to late 70s. So we're talking about the, uh, the rerun craze when, when Star Trek became really big in syndication. So here you see, first of all, there's our friends there, Kirk and Spock. By the way, you notice the hand with the phaser is blocking the face of the guy in the red shirt who's probably going to die anyway. Come on. There's actually, it's funny, I saw a thing recently on the internet. It's a Star Trek t-shirt, and it's like the red uniform shirt, and it has stamped on it, expendable. Because obviously, nine times out of ten, when someone died on a Star Trek episode, it was a poor security guy in the red shirt. So I think it's kind of funny that they're doing that. And they're just zapping some poor alien guy here. And... I bring this up for an interesting reason that I'll get to in a, in a bit. But first, let's uh, take a look at the box. Now, first of all, we uh, open this up here. And out comes the device. Now, the first thing you see is this kind of odd-looking shape thing right here. And it actually has a clip on it. So you can clip it to something. And this was the target. So this was what you actually aimed your, your phaser pistol at. And you see here, it's a mock-up of a Klingon battle cruiser. So, it, and, and you look here, I mean, it's a standard bicycle reflector. That's all it is, basically. So you, you have that, and then you open this up. 
And here you go. Now, this is the Phaser 2. Obviously, people say, why do they call it the Phaser 2? Well, the, remember, the Phaser 1 was the hand phaser. The Phaser 2 was the, uh, the actual pistol phaser. Although, this one here is actually a little bigger. If you look at the actual specs for the Phaser used in the Star Trek show, this one's a little pudgy. This one's a little pudgy, but they had to fit all the electronics in, and they figured it was close enough, and kids would think it would look cool, so there you go. So, so basically, um, you, you just shoot it, and bing, there we go. So what you want to do is you want to try and hit the target. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go over here and hold this up. Hear that? Now, if I hit here, you don't hear anything, right? But if it beeps, it means I've hit the target. Great way to drive your parents absolutely bonkers. Hey, Mom, look at this. <laughs> I bet you a lot of parents hated the folks at Mego for putting something like this out. Now, here's the part where it gets funny, because in the target, now, the, the instructions, basically, this here, you could clip it to something, or you could actually have someone clip it to a belt or clip it so that basically that's their target. So, for instance, you could run around and have this thing clipped on your shirt pocket and run around and... Got you! Now here's the interesting thing. On the cover, they've actually, they're shooting an alien there. Uh, that was uh, one of the aliens from uh, Let, the, uh, Let This Be Your Last Battlefield. Um, Frank Gorshin was in the episode. And uh, I think the uh, Sharon was the name of the alien. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. It's just after a while the memory starts going. Uh, so you see someone getting zapped on the cover of the game. Now the target is a Klingon battleship. Now. I'm wondering about this. Did they not want to put an alien in here because they didn't want to spread the message that, hey, it's okay to shoot at things? Granted, you've got a belt loop, so you're shooting at someone anyway if they're wearing it on the belt loop. But you look at Star Trek logic, okay? You've got a hand phaser. This is a Klingon battle cruiser. What use would a hand phaser be against a Klingon battle cruiser? Except as a targeting device. It's like, hey, Klingon battle cruiser, bing, okay, now you know where to hit me. All disruptors, come and get me. <laughs> It's just one of those really kind of bizarre head-scratching things, but uh, there you go. Still a lot of fun as a kid, and a great way to drive your parents completely up the wall. It's the Star Trek Super Phaser 2 target game. And that's been a look at how we used to compute and play back in the day. I'm your host, Bill Robert. Thank you for tuning in to Tech Throwback. We'll be back next time with some more stuff that's cool and old school. We'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in.